Okay, well, I want to thank everyone for coming to our final panel of the day and for, for attending our workshop. I'm Erica Mincer. I am an attorney here at the Antitrust Division, and I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists uh, today. So our panels up till now have largely focused on kind of the state of where things are. We had some nuts and bolts, and we had this, this the last uh, very engaging panel on competition in some of the television and online space. And this panel is going to focus a little more on where things are headed and what our um, experts see as the future of advertising. Um, there are longer bios attached to the agenda in the handouts, and um, so everybody can read those at your leisure, and I will just give a brief uh, bio for our panelists. So to my right is Christina Baumier, who is the Vice President of Product TV Platform at AT&T's advertising and analytics company, Xander, where she's responsible for the strategy and execution of digital and TV technology convergence. Christina holds an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management and a BA from American University. And next to me is Catherine Hayes, who co-founded and served as Executive Director of the Future of Advertising program at the Wharton School. Here, she brought together an international network of executives, innovators, and academics focused on improving advertising and marketing for brands, people, and society. She's the co-author of the book, Beyond Advertising, Creating Value Through All Customer Touch Points. Over the past four years, Catherine has been hosting uh, the uh, number of chief marketing officers on the monthly CMO Spotlight Show on Wharton's Sirius XM Business Radio Channel. To my left is Howard Schimmel, and Howard is the president of Janus Insights and Analysis, a new US-based research consultancy. Prior to starting this company, Howard was the Chief Research Officer at Turner, where he oversaw all multi-screen entertainment, news, children's, and sports research. While at Turner, he oversaw the launch of Turner Ad Labs, an initiative who, whose goal was to make recommendations about linear and digital video ad experience in light of the changing TV landscape. Howard's experience <coughs> includes leadership roles at the Nielsen Company, America Online, and MTV Networks. And to his left is Chris Ripley, who is the CEO, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Sinclair Broadcast Group, which is one of the largest television broadcasting companies. Chris has held this position since January, since January of 2017, and prior to that, he was the company's CFO. Before Sinclair, Mr. Ripley was a Managing Director at UBS Investment Bank's Global Media Group, where he managed, advised, and structured various financings and merger and acquisition transactions in the broadcast and entertainment <coughs> sectors. And at the end to my left is Dave Morgan. Dave is the CEO and founder of the television advertising company Simul Media. Dave previously founded Dakota, an <coughs> online advertising company. He also founded Real Media, one of the first ad-serving and online ad network companies, and a predecessor to 24-7 Real Media, which was later sold to WPP. So I'm going to uh, start by having each of the panelists give a brief inter introduction and make some points that they would like. And given that we just came off of a panel that was focusing uh, on some of the uh, competitive dynamics within television advertising, I thought we could start with uh, Chris Ripley. Thanks, Erica. Uh, you know, there really are few things more important uh, to us as broadcasters than the antitrust division, understanding the dynamics of our marketplace and uh, it's really important that the rules of the road be set up to foster innovation and competition. So I thank you for giving me this opportunity. I brought a few slides here behind me uh, that will take you through where the industry has been and, uh, and where it's evolved from here. So I, I think what you've heard over the last couple of days undoubtedly is that the TV broadcast industry faces more challenges than ever. Uh, we compete for content, audience, and advertising, and all three have steadily lost to cable. On this chart here, you can see that over the last four decades, broadcast TV has lost close to 75% of its audience to cable. As a result, the TV audience has become highly fragmented. No single broadcast or cable channel has more than 10% audience share, and this would be even further diminished if we added premium digital video services to the chart. <coughs> over the last decade, over the top and, and 
digital video streaming services have emerged as a new competitor in the local video ad market. Several of the well-known players like Netflix don't have ads, but many more have launched such as Roku and Pluto that do, and, that do have ads and increasingly you're seeing local advertisers on those services. So here you can see digital advertising is skyrocketing while broadcast TV advertising is stagnant. More specifically within digital, digital video ads are the fastest growing segment expected to double from 2016 to 2021, reaching over 22 billion, which is more than all the local ad revenues of the TV broadcast industry combined. Now I just want to uh, take a special note. I thought the last panel did an excellent job of framing the discussion here, uh, but some of the panels uh, the day before I think conflated uh, what digital is. And it's very important I think for people to realize that when uh, you know, five years ago when people talked about digital, they were often talking about search and display. And today we're focused on digital video ads and them being a substitute for cable and broadcast ads. I think that's a very important distinction and a lot of the discussion yesterday conflated the word digital because it means different things to different people. And this slide right here is very important because digital video ads is the fastest growing segment right now within digital and creating a, a lot of competition for our broadcast stations. So despite ample competition, restrictive government regulations make broadcast station groups pygmies in a land of giants. As you can see on this page, we don't even show up. And without scale, we will not be able to innovate and bring new and relevant experiences to consumers. So what are we doing to stay relevant? We're improving our broadcast news and entertainment programming. We're making it available on multiple platforms like News On, which I'll speak about later on. ATSC 3.0 is rolling out. We're finalizing deployment plans to make 3.0 available in 20 to 30 markets by the end of the year. The industry has committed to 40 markets. This will make us more competitive with cable and video marketplaces. Sorry, digital video marketplaces. We're expanding into cable. We bought Tennis Channel. We're also expanding into regional sports networks. We'll be launching the Cubs next year. Potentially some others, which you may have heard some rumors about. We're expanding into digital. Earlier this year, we launched a free, over-the-top, ad-supported video streaming service called Stir, which includes a wide range of programming, including local news. And we're also using our local sales force to sell third-party OTT video streaming ads to our advertisers. Specifically, this strategy, which was mentioned in the earlier panel by Dave Lugie, is a similar one that we pursue. And just as in Dave's company, it happens to be the fastest growing digital service in Sinclair's history. So why is that? The reality is that it's easy for the sales force to sell the same ads from the same advertisers, but just putting them on a different platform. And to me, that example right there really underscores how fungible these markets have become. Thanks, Erica. Thank you very much, Chris. Now, if we could go to Christina. Sure. Um, thank you for, for having me here. It's uh, actually nice to be back. Um, 17 years ago, nearly to the day, I started my first job at the Department of Justice um, in the Office of Consumer Litigation as an honors paralegal, um, which is the beginning of an unconventional career that led me ultimately to um, advertising technology. Um, I made several career transitions, but over the last eight years have been you know, keenly focused on um, video and television advertising and uh, building technology platforms that help evolve um, the transformation of television that we're seeing. So I'm, uh, I'm from Xander. Xander is AT&T's advertising company, uh, formerly called AT&T Advertising and Analytics. This is a new advertising company that's been given a mandate from our chairman and CEO, uh, Randall Stevenson, and the board of AT&T to build a new and different kind of advertising company. And our purpose is to make advertising matter. We have the resources and backing of AT&T to really reimagine the way that advertising is bought and sold and ultimately consumed by our customers. Uh, and we do this by using AT&T's assets in content, in distribution, in data and technology 
that make it ultimately easier and more efficient for advertisers to reach their audiences at scale in premium content environments while helping publishers, including AT&T's own, owned and operated properties, but also importantly, third-party publishers, monetize their, ad their inventory. We have incredible scale uh, in our consumer touch points, and we power more than 170 million unique uh, consumer interaction, direct-to-consumer relationships across our wireless, video, and broadband businesses. We are one of the largest PTV and wireless providers in the country, uh, with the largest national addressable TV footprint in live, um, live advertising. We closed in September, or August, excuse me, an acquisition of AppNexus, which was uh, the largest independent advertising digital platform in the market. By bringing together these two companies over the last eight months, uh, we've accelerated the launch of a technology platform that will serve as the foundation of a premium advertising marketplace. Together uh, with our assets and with our, importantly with our customers, uh, we are making advertising more relevant and importantly more engaging and less disruptive to consumers. We're also building a next generation advertising platform to apply the same power and precision of digital and uh, targeting and measurement in digital to television and premium, um, premium video. Thank you very much. And now sticking with uh, television <coughs> advertising, maybe we could go to Dave Morgan. Good morning. <clears throat> and I want to thank the Department of Justice and our Trust Division for hosting this. I think it's a great time with so much happening in the industry and what we see ahead. Simon Media is a, a New York-based technology company, um, about just over 10 years old. And our focus is to bring a digital approach to TV, to linear TV, to sort of the old-fashioned TV. So I think it'll tie together a lot of some of the things you've heard from yesterday and today. Um, we use data and technology to try to, um, you know, to try to bring more of a digital experience to TV advertising. We run two linear ad marketplaces, um, um, one transparent TV for traditional brand advertisers, one D2CX.com for the emerging uh, uh, direct brands, and the top 10 plus of the, the uh, national TV companies in the United States work with us. Um, the first thing is, because I'm a digital person, I started almost 30 years ago, I always usually have to talk about the fact that TV is not dead and it's not dying and TV advertising is not dying. It's very robust. One of the examples I like to use is um, Judge Judy. So today, I mean, I know if you've got a DVR, if you don't get out of here fast enough, Judge Judy is going to be on to me two 30-minute segments and she is going to cue more audience ad minutes, people watching video advertising in that one hour of those two together, than about 85% of all of the videos on all of YouTube and all of America all day. So, I mean, and she doesn't always win her time slot every day either. Sometimes Wheel of Fortune reruns or Jeopardy or something will beat it. Now, Judge Judy does not make a, fra well, she personally makes a massive amount of money. Um, <laughs> but that show does not generate anything close to the monetization of YouTube because of, um, you know, the lack of a lot of digital capacity sort of, you know, down the funnel. And the other things I think that are important, and, you know, there'll be different statistics, and it's, you know, but um, there's other reasons that we're going to see TV be around for a long time, which is exciting, um, because you have a significant amount of U.S. households that don't have fixed broadband, and you have, um, in, Microsoft put out something recently, and a fair amount of the broadband isn't even of that high quality yet for all of the streaming services. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, it, that doesn't take away from the fact that two-thirds of America do have fixed broadband at home, and we also have mobile devices. But, you know, at least I, I feel that from a digital person, um, for 15 years, I went into TV 10 years ago because I believe the TV will be around. It doesn't mean all the TV companies will be able to be competitive because of some of the challenges. And this slide really captures the biggest difference from an advertising standpoint between TV and digital, and that, um, and you've heard the funnel used in probably every panel in one way or another, but the, where digital is able to stay in state between an ads presentation and an ultimate transaction and interactions in between and present reporting, sometimes it isn't accurate, but at least present reporting to show the path and the interactions all the way down the funnel is an enormous competitive advantage <coughs> for digital. And television 
where its measurement has really been limited in a syndicated, widely available way at the very top, which is one of the reasons it's only really gotten consideration typically for a lot of the more reach and branding advertising, though you know, any local merchant likes, will know like, you know, they can tell what happens. But this is, this is the area that we've been working on fixing in Simul Media, which is using data from how people actually view and buy to understand how TV is impacting sales and transactions and how it's working with different digital ads at the same time, maybe by those companies or others. Now, one of the things you heard yesterday with Mark Pritchard, and you've heard a lot of talk about targeting, but if the one thing I think everybody agrees on is that television advertising's biggest problem is waste. Um, you know, it is a great reaching medium, but, but the efficiency of the, the, the TV systems as they exist today and some of the pricing models and planning models that exist from some cases from the 1980s um, undervalue and under yield both the inventory that's coming from TV and the consumer experience. And so, you know, in the digital world, and I think a lot of people believe the future of advertising is going to be fewer, more relevant ads. But unfortunately, for most of the technology in classic TV, it's not there yet to do it. Things like ATSC 3.0, how was that? Good. <laughs> Are going to help. But, but TV is not able to compete effectively in a lot of the different buckets. And so what you see here is the amount of yield opportunity that's available in, in a lot of the different buckets as they have been historically looked at in TV um, by bringing more data and tech. And basically, it's not taking the pricing up, it's taking the waste away so that the effective pricing, the effective CPM um, is more consistent with what the advertiser expects. This is a projection of like, you know, sort of an amalgamation of different projections of the future of premium video advertising. There's a couple things that should be obvious from it, which is one, the blue is national linear TV, the green is local linear TV, the, the red is that will be more data enhanced and, and data targeted. Um, the yellow is addressable. The orange, which is obviously growing really fast, is the premium over the top in digital video. Um, when you heard today about, like in the panel before particularly, but also yesterday, you know, there's no question that as, this, as, as more of the technology comes in, the money is going to be flowing up and down that group and being priced against each other in a lot of ways as the technology comes in. But, you know, I think it's going to mean, you know, for the TV companies to be able to make, and this is certainly where we've made our bets, is how do you bring some of the technology to do that? And, you know, I think there's some, some challenges that certainly exist for the, for the industry, as I see it, as a digital person that's working within it. One, there's an extraordinary and relentless competition for viewers and advertising. And um, we work with the TV companies promoting the programming. And having, obviously, a lot of this programming now available for, for subsidized for e-commerce delivery or with um, um, no ads is, 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 is creating a lot of issues. Two, and this is something that Mark Pritchard um, brought up yesterday that I think is critical. The, the global ad agencies that drive a lot of the national spend have um, uh, tend to favor digital out because of fees structure and commingled economics outside of the U.S. And then finally, we are now starting to see the digital platforms taking, particularly in the high precision direct response space and also in the local space where the prices have been high. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'd just like to say one thing about um, Dave's presentation that I thought was just notable. Um, that um, he was talking about TV, and uh, I wouldn't want anyone to think he was just talking about broadcast TV. When he says TV, he means broadcast and cable. Yes. Together. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you know, part of this part of this panel is to determine whether these are in fact two of the same markets or are they separate markets. And the fact that he just says TV and doesn't and takes it for granted that he's talking about broadcast cable, uh, I think, is a notable uh, point uh, to to mention. Thank you. Um, from Howard. Yeah, good morning. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to participate on the panel. I want to use my remarks today to talk about the state of audience measurement in the United States and the challenges it addresses, it's facing as it addresses this digital, addressable TV, connected TV world. And I want to focus on two really important items. Um, the first is, and you've heard it from Mark yesterday, you heard it a little bit on the panel this morning, reach. Reach to an advertiser is air. Advertisers need the ability to accumulate large amounts of reach to have successful brands. So that's the first item. The second is market transparency. 
The market is moving from a highly transparent television marketplace, using the old definition, to a highly um, fragmented, walled garden marketplace of digital and addressable. And I think research suppliers need to fill in some roles and missing data. You heard a little bit of it on the earlier panel when they talked about uh, market transparency in terms of ad spend. Um, so I want to talk about those two things. The reality is we need a vibrant market research economy in the United States. Um, if you think about the state of companies like Nielsen, Comscore, Simmons, and MRI, we don't have one today. Um, so let's start with a little quick historical journey. Uh, Fifteen years ago, um, before cable operators were harvesting their set-top box data, and before smart TV manufacturers were harvesting ACR data, automatic content rec recognition, where they know what's hitting the TV class, we were totally dependent on Nielsen for audience data measuring TV. Um, the entire marketplace used Nielsen. It was a totally transparent market. We all knew each other's shares. Um, you know, we used Nielsen to develop rating guarantees for spots we're selling in the future. Um, we used CPMs to figure out how much then those spots cost. And then after the spots aired, we used Nielsen to determine did the advertiser reach their guarantee or not. Um, you know, it's important to think as we think about m managing a linear and a digital market that TV is a futures market, whereas Dave talked about digital is much more real time. Um, and if you think about the futures, in the next couple of weeks, you're going to have advertisers go into to the upfront, and they're going to be buying advertising through September 2020. They're going to be spending, you know, 16 months ahead of things. So fast forward to the digital world. Um, in a digital world, there was no need for a company like Nielsen because any digital company had an accurate census measure of the number of ads that they serve for a given advertiser. Um, if you think about the role that a company like Comscore played, it was much more around media and evaluation, uh, media planning and an evaluation tool than it was a currency used to drive the marketplace. Um, and this is a world that digital video lives in today. Um, now let's fast forward to the world of addressable TV, connected TV, over the top. Um, these businesses operate much more like a digital video business. Um, whether, it's whether it's Xander or NCC, you know, the organization Marcian rep represents, um, they all have first party data to drive ad execution and to drive measurement and they only rely on companies like Nielsen or Comscore for things like converting impressions served to age sex demographics. Um, so the first research challenge I think we're facing is how do we integrate these two worlds? How do we integrate the world of linear TV, which is gonna be around for a while, it's not gonna go away, with the world of digital? Um, we need to solve that today if we're gonna enable advertisers to use video regardless of the definition to build reach. The second issue we have is one of market transparency and um, insights. Um, when I had my job at Turner as Chief Research Officer, part of our job was to do an accurate job of counting the market. We needed to know what was going on with video consumption, regardless of who was providing that video, whether it was ad supported, whether it was SVOD, and we needed to know exactly where, um, you know, what, what device it was uh, being consumed on. With the advent of Netflix and their success in driving viewership, um, because Netflix realized they didn't need to play with Nielsen because they're not in the ad business, suddenly our ability to have insights into the market was dramatically limited. And you know, arguably Netflix is probably the number one rated video source on the TV screen in America. Um, so you know, part of the research challenge is how do we enable programmers at local stations at national networks to have good insights so that they can actually develop smart programming strategies, have successful programs with big ratings? Um, you know, one specific area where I think the lack of cross-platform measurement and an infrastructure that allows an agency to plan, execute, and measure cross-platform is this issue of advertiser reach. At the end of the day, an advertiser has a certain amount of budget to spend. They want to use all tools in their, in, in, that they have dis, at their disposal to drive lots of reach. 
Uh, there was recently research um, presented by Les Binet of Adam and Eve, DDB Needham in, in um, England, uh, that show that brand building is achieved by optimizing reach against a broad advertiser target. That reach uh, accounts for 91% of media effectiveness. Advertisers used to rely on TV to get reach fast. It was easy. Um, but as TV has fragmented, and they know they need to use other alternatives like digital video and platforms like Xander, the research world has not created an infrastructure that allows an advertiser to plan effectively. It's a big, big missing um, problem. Brand building needs to be an important tool that advertisers are able to leverage through video. Um, the second area I want to talk about really quickly is this issue of market transparency. Um, for all of its limitations, the linear TV market does have a fairly high degree of transparency. Separate from the spend discussion you heard earlier, we look at Nielsen data, we know our share of GRPs in a given content genre, given programming set, relative to our competitive networks. Um, in the digital world, we have no idea how well we're doing relative to specific content. Um, and if you think about it too, um, the advertisers don't have the ability to know when they're going to a platform like Xander or they're going to a platform like Facebook exactly what their marketing spend might accomplish where in TV you know if I'm going to buy 300 GRPs I'm going to get 60 reach and 5 frequency. Um, you know the transparency helps a 70 billion dollar television market operate effectively and I worry that as the market moves to digital addressable connected TV where is that market transparency that allows the market to operate effectively? It's one place also where I think research suppliers have not kept up with what the market needs. Um, you know, the United States does not have a joint industry operating committee that, me that operates media measurement, like some other foreign countries do. Um, now, I'm not suggesting necessarily that the U.S. needs a chick. Uh, but we do need a better mechanism for ensuring that the developments of suppliers like Nielsen and Comscore need exactly what the, the industry needs. Thanks. I look forward to the Q&A. Okay. Thank you very much, Howard. Now, uh, Catherine can give us the broader advertising marketing perspective. It will be broader. Let's sort of <laughs> pu pu pull out a little bit. Um, so a little bit of background in terms of my frame of reference uh, and the perspective that I bring here today. Um, I was at AT&T for 16 years, um, so in the private sector on the B2B side, but uh, it, it was a telephone company back then. <laughs> Certainly more than that, communications company, but it's, it's much different then. Um, and then in 2007, Professor Jerry Wind, who's um, a renowned marketing professor at the Wharton School ran a research center called the SEI Center for Advanced Studies and Management. And the job that he had in running that center was to ensure that Wharton's management education was really reflective of the realities that were going on in the marketplace. And so in 2007, his board of advisors, who represents the private sector as well as academics, said, there's some crazy stuff going on in this advertising world. We should try to take a look at it. So that was really the brief that was given to us. Um, we put a global advisory board together, which grew to about 90 people. The first thing that we tried to do was to do kind of an ollie ollie entry of the research community to say, OK, what do we know now about what works in advertising? and pulled together sort of a really a who's who from a global academics as well as practitioners in the research community to try to really establish what's the highest bar of empirical generalizations, findings that held true across multiple studies, not just one. We had a, a large conference at the Wharton School in the end of 2008, published a Journal of Advertising Research special issue with those findings from Conscore and others. Um, and then had a follow-up conference a couple years later as things continued to evolve and published another special issue. But when we stopped and took a look at that and said, what have we really learned here? What can be actually proven to work? We realized that that kind of research was very much looking in the rear view mirror. Yes, it was rigorous. Yes, it held true. But it was very minute. And it really wasn't providing this vast array of, of advisors that from all different parts of the ecosystem, from media companies, uh, academics, researchers, cultural anthropologists, really trying to get a very broad perspective on it. And so we took a different approach. And that was to say, 
um, a different research approach which is based on idealized design. So rather than trying to predict the future, we said what's the best that the future could should be if we imagine all of these changing pieces and put a stake in the ground? And secondly, what should we do now to get ready for that more desirable future? And if you imagine it, if you start to do those things, you can actually co-create that better future. Um, I can get into more of what some of the outcomes were, but one of the essential notions was that we are all in this ecosystem together, and if we take a very narrow lens, it can be an us versus them. And a lot of times we talk about these as consumers, but really we took a step back and said, these are individuals. These are people with lives. And a lot of them are blocking and trying to get away from advertising as much as is possible. So what if we could create more of a win, 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 win? So media companies are winning because they're gaining uh, viewers and uh, bodies and people who are, are, are wanting to be part of their properties. Um, uh, agencies are winning because creative is becoming more creative and more desirable, as you were talking. Um, and then people are getting better because they don't hate advertising. Advertising is at the bottom and still remains there in terms of lack of trust. So, um, and then finally, the outsized influence that advertising has on culture and society. We all know and we've all seen, especially in the last few years, just how important it is. So this lens about what happens here and how the results of this happen, what the confluence and the composition of this, um, this ecosystem are, have really far-ranging um, implications. Great, thank you very much. Um, before I get into some of the questions I prepared, I, in looking at uh, these initial presentations, it did prompt a couple questions. If I could just ask um, maybe of Dave and of, of Chris. Um, Dave, I had a question on this, uh, so everyone can see the bar graph that was showing. Looked like at least some decline in some of the linear advertising going into out years, and a pickup by you know some of the, ad the addressable categories and data advanced categories. Mm -hmm. Just wondering, is the linear? Do you see that? Is that? Are those? What, what are the current advertising moving into those other color graphs, or is that a reduction of ad load? Or I think, which I think, there's a, several factors that are coming together there. Um, um, one, you have reduction in, in viewership, in, in reduction in ad exposure. Um, you know, both on the pro, you know, on those, you know, on the products that are being sold, on the programming, um, as they're shifting to you know non-ad supported products or, or streaming products or, or products on the phone. Two. There will be, you know, I'm, we do expect a reduction in ad load as it becomes, a, you know, um, proactively managed by whether networks or distributors um, because they're trying to sell, in the end of the day, fewer higher value ads as they bring more data to it. Um, there will probably be rotation of new advertisers in. So, for example, we're starting to see some of the digital companies that Ty mentioned in the earlier panel are starting to discover TV when they really want to scale their businesses. Um, we're also seeing category reductions. It tends to happen a lot around that. So, like areas like retail, for example, have been in a lot of sort of cyclical decline. So, um, and then I think the other area where it's going to become more interesting and more fluid is um, is outcome based and performance advertising because that's the area that um, you know. They, used to be the classified ads or the yellow pages or um, you know that became search and that's certainly where Facebook has been playing a lot. Um, TV had the direct response category which was not very effectively managed and so we think that that category is going to change to a more managed type and then the performance um, is going to flow. There will be some new money coming into TV um, but it will be definitely around more data enhanced and addressable products. And that's Oh, yeah, just one other thing to add is is and it's the important it's an important thing based on Dave's last point is if you think about an advertiser like Procter and Gamble, they spend much more money in trade promotion, coupons, store in store display than they do in traditional advertising. Um, they do that because they know that if they run a coupon, they drive some top line sales at the end of the quarter. They're trying to make their quarterly targets. With the capabilities that Dave described, one of the reasons the, the overall spend is going to grow is that TV is going to be able to tap into some of those below the line marketing dollars that it's never been able to tap into before. Okay, great. 
that was um, one other thing I, I just want to add to this chart is that um, at, at the point oh, I God. made before sorry <laughs> <laughs> um, linear uh, you know that the chart has linear television yep. national and local yep. linear television exists on broadcast exists on cable and it even exists in digital uh, video services and that's what you're seeing there and then you're, you're seeing the mix change to more targeted from just straight linear untargeted uh, you know, that's just a, a natural uh, evolution of the marketplace because targeted uh, gets rid of, uh, uh, is more efficient. And so you're seeing dollars shift into targeted and digital is natively targetable and uh, linear is increasingly becoming more targetable. The interconnects can do targeted. Uh, when ATSC 3.0 rolls out for broadcast, we'll be able to do targeted. And it's, it's certainly a disadvantage we have right now on the, on the linear world. Um, but, um, but we'll catch up from a technology perspective. And, and also, I just want to make sure everyone understands that um, targeted does not mean that you can't do DMA wide or broad. It just means that you can, you can do, if you can do targeted, you can do broad, but if you, if you can only do broad, you can't do targeted. Oh, yeah, actually, maybe that's a good thing for, yeah. um, that Howard could address a little bit. The, the distinctions, we hear programmatic, we hear addressable, we hear targeted, we hear audience-based, and maybe really briefly let everybody, so everybody understands the differences and how they're, you know, who they're hitting. Um, yeah, and, and maybe one way to think about it is, um, you know, obviously the linear TV world is one signal going out to many people, right? And, you know, with that many people, you are... Um, even, even, even for something like Adult Swim, one of the Warner Media networks, um, you think that there are only teenagers and 18 to 24 year olds watching that, but the reality is there are some people my age watching Adult Swim. Mm -hmm. and, you can, and in a linear world, you cannot avoid that, you know, your ad um, you know, going to someone to my age. Um, in an in, in audience-based buying world, it still is one to many. You're, an advertiser is still buying one spot, but what you're doing is you're using data to inform the decision of that spot. Here's a spot, I think it's gonna do a better job of reaching serial buyers for Kellogg's than another program. And then addressable is purely one to one. You know, Each of us would get a different ad if we went to the ESPN home screen today. Is that? Yeah, no, that, that, I think that's helpful, thank you. I just I think I had the one little piece which I think is, is connects those. Um, the way we look at it, when we're looking for a person, um, you know, to us, it, you know, whether we, we're synthesizing the data of actual viewing from the set top boxes or screens, and so whether we're picking that person out of a local broadcast station, um, a local cable, or a national, like those are all being looked. That's how the audience base is looking. So we heard before that's sort of the digital approach now to TV, which is cutting across every different form of distribution, irrespective of distribution. There's a lot of social engineering problems that have to be worked out and electrical engineering problems, but that's where it's going. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then, Chris, for you on, um, on your presentation, uh, which is really interesting, um, I, just, I had a question on, you know, there was a slide showing the share uh, broadcast um, versus cable. And then a couple other slides that showed the revenue changes, and it had broadcast um, and cable staying pretty flat, so they're not really don't seem to be losing revenue. And I get, there are a couple of points. I guess one, you'd, you'd think when TV first entered, also you'd see a steep curve, which isn't necessarily indicative that anything else is losing share. It's just one is growing. You mean when um, digital first entered? No, I meant when TV, actually. If, if, you, if we looked, we'd probably see a similar steep curve of, of TV growing. You know, it, it comes in in the 1950s, and, and people are gathering around. Um, I see. There are four channels. So I wonder, you know, what do we actually glean from the, from the curve of the digital growth, one? And then two, is there anything, you know, when, when the revenue is staying flat, what is keeping the companies maintaining their revenues? Is it moving into these digital spaces or what, higher prices and revenues? So I, th I think what's important about that slide is, is not so much that, um, that the, the broadcast uh, line is flat. It's that the overall market uh, over the last five years has grown by 20%. And so therefore, if you're flat, that means you've lost share. And in fact, um, the, on the local ad side, uh, TV broadcast uh, share has uh, declined by about four percentage points uh, you know, due to that phenomenon. So 
um, and, and on a constant dollar basis, when you take into account uh, inflation, we've actually shrunk. So, so it, uh, it is uh, impacting us in, in a quite significant way because our, our costs inflate, but our revenue does not grow. And uh, that's just indicative of the fungibility of the marketplace and, and, and dollars, you know, moving to the digital. Um, which leads me into actually the first question I had for you, which is, in light of that, what actions, what is Sinclair doing to keep its business relevant? <laughs> well, look, we're, we're, we're definitely looking to expand into other platforms. And uh, Sinclair has uh, been fairly aggressive amongst the broadcasters uh, moving into streaming. Uh, we operate News On, which has uh, news, newscasts uh, on demand and, and in pattern in 90-plus percent of the DMAs. Uh, you can get that on, on Roku, on your mobile devices, and watch your, watch your local news. It offers a full suite of uh, ad pods there for national and local advertisers. We also launch Stir, uh, which includes Stir City, which is your local channel, plus uh, about, I think we're up to about 40 other national channels uh, via streaming on Roku, Fire, Apple TV, etc. And um, it's really, a re we, all, we also have websites, mobile apps, and those all include video too. So we're, uh, we're trying to spread our content to as many platforms as possible so that we can actually compete for the advertising dollar uh, on, those, uh, on those platforms. I think it was Howard who mentioned ATSC, um, if you could just maybe briefly explain what that is the importance of that? Sure. ATSC 3.0, a bit of a mouthful, is the next gen broadcast standard. It is uh, rolling out starting this year. The industry is committed uh, to rolling out 40 markets starting this year. Um, it is, there's really five key benefits to ATSC 3.0. Number one is it's a mobile first standard. Uh, the second is that it's IP end to end, so it'll support a hybrid environment where you can bring high bandwidth content over the air and integrate it in with pub the public internet content to a seamless user experience. It, uh, number three is that it will allow for targeted advertising, which as we've, we've all talked about is something that traditional broadcast television is in need, in need of if it's to compete in the digital landscape. And it will allow for subscription-based services uh, to natively be on the platform. So if you want to have a paywall, you want to have something that looks like a Netflix uh, you can do that over ATSC 3.0. And last but not least, it will dramatically increase the capacity uh, that we all have to, to send content to consumers. And so that's going to create yet more choices for consumers uh, to, uh, uh, for, for content consumption. So is that more in terms of like see more networks? Uh, more networks. Yeah, you've already more seen. Experiences you've, or? Right. You've you've uh, uh, over the air over even the last five years has already seen a, a, a significant uptick in the number of networks. Uh, we call them multi multicast networks that are available over the air. 3.0 will increase capacity by four to five times of what we have today, and I expect a lot more networks to be added uh, in that capacity. Plus. Uh, other data forms will move over 3.0. Um, uh, servicing connected cars uh, is something that we, we think is a big opportunity for that spectrum. I will put out a plea for someone to develop a really user-friendly TV guide. for. <laughs> yeah. Can I add something to ATSC? So two other things that are important about ATSC 3.0. Um, one is when you think about the digital world, remember that Facebook has over a million US advertisers, right? Facebook's been able to build an advertising that could be highly, highly localized just based on self-serve platform, being able to, uh, you know, the local, um, the local uh, dry cleaner can buy Facebook. And television nationally has a couple of hundred advertisers driving the business. I don't know if you've ever counted how many local spot TV advertisers there really are. But it's not a million. It's not that many. <laughs> so, so part of the reason digital has grown is they've been able to tap into advertisers that just would never think about buying an entire market or nationally. Um, the, other, the other big thing about ATSC 3.0 is that Netflix has an inherent advantage over any TV programmer. They have first party data on every user, right? They know what each of us do when we, when we use their platform. They could use that to drive recommendations. They could use that to drive um, building new content. 
ATSC 3.0, when it's enabled, will give um, Chris's station Netflix-like census data to be able to make better programming, marketing, own the customer relationship. Well said, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, uh, Christina, against all of this, could you tell us a little bit where Xander fits in and where you see maybe the video um, advertising fitting into all of this and how it might differentiate itself? Yeah, I mean, we see, we see it from, you know, I, I like to look at things from the perspective of the consumer, and there's no doubt that national um, traditional TV is converging with, um, with digital video. Um, and this starts, again, with the consumer and how she's consuming content. Um, across all different devices. So, um, you know, what used to be traditional TV being consumed on one device in the household, now it's being consumed across a number of devices, a connected TV, the set-top box, um, you know, the mobile device, um, et cetera. And even, and even actually different OTT apps, um, different app experiences where um, you know, from a delivery standpoint, from a, it, it looks very fragmented, but for a consumer, it's a, it's a unified and single experience. So we spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and so even though the, the t television and the digital video delivery systems are very different um, and remain different from a technology standpoint, uh, for the consumer, they're increasingly one. And we think also from the perspective of the advertiser, these are coming together also. Um, so, but the model, the, the delivery aspects and the technology is catching up and that's what we're really focused on at Xander. Um, we see ourselves in a unique, in a unique um, place because we have, we straddle both worlds with the, um, in the television world, uh, we have, you know, we own those pipes from a pay TV perspective with the direct TV business, direct TV now. And, um, and our TV, where TV everywhere applications, so um, and that's been a good business for us, um, you know, for the, for our overall video business. So for the fa past couple of years, we've we've grown this business. We are the leader in addressable. You know, Howard talked about addressable um, advertising. Um, that is uh, that is a really, you know, powerful value prop for advertisers, um, and also for consumers. Um, but we also play in the um, uh, we also offer the ability to buy on on a GRP, right, in a more clustered in a more clustered way. So um, that traditional model is something that um, we don't see going away per se, but starting to think about the evolution there. Um, and that that really brings us to the other world, which is um, which is digital and OTT. Um, and here, that's where AppNexus comes in as the global internet company. Um, that uses data and machine learning to power um, a set of enterprise cloud-based um, uh, advertising technology products that are sold to buyers of advertising as well as sold to publishers, uh, media owners. Um, in, over the course of the life of AppNexus, it's historically been very display focused, but over the last few years, um, we've developed a lot of the video capabilities. Um, and uh, so there's the enterprise business, um, and then there's also the marketplace. And so a marketplace is effectively where we bring together, um, bring together the buy side and the sell side in order to facilitate a transaction. Again, largely in the digital world. But we see these things, you know, what has typically been a very siloed um, two sort of siloed universes because for the consumer it's coming together because the advertisers need them to come together we're now building pipes and bridges to make TV really to make let me start with digital to make digital look more TV like um, as television goes digital to allow for um, those enterprise products to um, facilitate um, both on the buy side and the sell side uh, TV-like transactions, and um, and and allow those to happen in the marketplace as well, um, and then also on the on the TV side to enable a more automated way. Um, you had asked about what you know what is programmatic. Programmatic can mean a lot of things. It's definitely buzzword bingo. It really depends on the eye, in the eye of the beholder. 
Um, but at a minimum, I think we could agree that it is automation. And so we see more automation coming to television um, and in that business as well. Catherine, um, on the automation front, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts given kind of the traditional way that advertising has been transaction, transacted in very personal business. Do you see that being adopted readily? In, uh, yeah, I think, I think it really kind of brings together uh, a lot of what's been discussed, and not just in this panel, but over the last, uh, over yesterday as well and earlier today. And that is when you talk about targeting, essentially what you're talking about is understanding who this person is. And so they're not viewers, they're individuals with habits and personalities and, and observable sorts of information that is increasingly being collected so that this targeting can happen in a far more um, a specific way. And so from the standpoint of um, programmatic, I think it, yeah, it goes from automated to programmatic to taking that data and infusing it with artificial intelligence and far more capable means of very, very quickly honing in on what is going to motivate this person to do something. And this is in addition to how much we're realizing and understanding and infusing all of this with what we're learning in neuroscience, with biometrics, all the different ways that we can understand, not just you know way, way beyond demographics, but are they in the mood to shop? Are they in to buy? Who else are they with? Why are they with them? Where were they yesterday? Where are they going tomorrow? <laughs> what are they wearing? Are they sad? Facial recognition. Pa all these passive technologies are putting all of what we're talking about, taking this notion of targeting and putting it on steroids. And so I think what we need to do is and understand as we're talking about these things in kind of business clinical sorts of ways that at the end of the day that's what's happening. And that currently we're talking about viewership and channels and pricing in terms of how we need to be seeing who has the power, but probably more importantly as we, you know, as the conversation has gone on about walled gardens and the data that they have that they're not sharing with anybody else, but what they're able to discern from those walled gardens is really fascinating with Walmart going to the new fronts and being able to show all of your shopping data, everything you're doing, presumably anonymized. It really, I think, is, is something that we need to think far more out than just uh, the immediate future about the implications of how uh, the data portion of it and the, um, what's happening to it and how people can be targeted in ways that they don't even understand. It's one thing if you watch a show or don't watch a show. It's a very another thing if you're being targeted because you're in an emotional state that you might not even really well understand. Um, no, on the Walt Garden front, uh, which we you just mentioned and we heard a little bit about uh, yesterday, I'm wondering if folks have, people have thoughts of, on the, is one, whether the convergence of TV into the digital space and the growth there will have any effect on um, sort of increasing, you know, opening up some gardens, adding another dimension of competition for these folks. Um, whether we think, you know, the talk around privacy, whether privacy maybe will become a larger dimension of competition. We heard, um, I think, uh, Professor McAfee mentioned uh, a, a browser brave that doesn't track your cookies, and is that going to be an offering that maybe uh, consumers are going to be looking for more going forward? It, I, can I just uh, jump in? I, it, you know, I, I mentioned that when we first started to, um, when we first put the Future of Advertising program together, there was, you know, just all this concern that there's this massive increase in ad blocking. And, and also, remember when it was like DVRs, you can skip through the ads and so you, you can't even see them. So there was this notion of the empowered consumer mm -hmm. who had far more ability to take control over how brands and media companies were, were talking to them. So I think it seems as though it's become a bit of an arms war. It's like, oh no, we can still find you. We can still <laughs> track you. We can pick data from so many different places. We can have these wonderful collaborations about people who know my buying behavior, my healthcare behavior. Um, there's already apps in cars and mobility to understand what my driving behaviors are and to therefore adjust um, whether to even give me insurance at all or what prices I pay. 
So um, I, I just think as though we really need to sort of delve into this notion of where the competition is going to be happening in the ownership of it and what the um, collaborations are going to be to be able to put that together in really powerful ways that, that um, change the balance of power. Yeah. Erica, if, if I could <clears throat> add, I think, you know, what's possible is obviously extraordinary. And I mean, I lived in this world and starting, you know, one of the first behavioral targeting companies, and I apologize for those shoes that are following <laughs> you around the internet. We didn't realize that retargeting tactic would be so effective. But I think this is one of the things we need to understand, which mm -hmm. is, you may have this idea, and we can talk about the extraordinary amount of science and energy that we're bringing to these things, but typically businesses that operate at massive scale, like media and advertising, it's a tactic or two that some things are pretty blunt that can really change the effectiveness. And so, you know, while you could really want to know everything about what they buy, the most important thing is just if someone actually looked at something in the last few weeks, their likelihood to buy that is much, much higher than um, somebody else. And even if they did already buy one, because you're always wondering, I already bought it, don't they know that? How dumb are they? Even if you already bought it, your likelihood to rebuy it is so much higher than not giving targeting. And so I think where we're probably going to see the most impact in this business, where the walled gardens probably will participate and open up a little bit more, is, um, is some of the simple tactics that can dramatically improve the effectiveness, efficiency, and consumer experience. Thus, like, Wasted frequency. No one wins. I mean, the large movie studios today that will drop sixty, seventy million dollars in advertising for a four quadrant, what they call a big, a big film coming out um, in three weeks' time, will hit. They will miss twenty percent of the people who are watching TV who are frequent moviegoers, even though they're spending so much money so quickly, and the ten percent that watch the, the most of the kinds of TV they typically buy will get on ad average about 100 exposures to that ad in those two and a half week time period. Now I don't know if 10 is, five is too few or if 100 is too much, but, but we're gonna get much better at that and I think those are the areas where the data is gonna work so we can trim out those 50 wasted exposures, reinvest that money in different places. But I think about it a couple of ways, one is the walled gardens have every right to use data to drive yield on a given deal, right? And, and they need that ability, um, you know, in a world where it's getting harder to drive yield off impressions. But I don't think that means that the walled gardens shouldn't be willing to let their, let some visibility into what they're able to accomplish sit in something like an agency planning tools. For, for those of you, you who aren't familiar, there is a person at an agency who is given um, you know, a $50 million TV budget, video budget, and they have to decide on the allocation. And it's important that they understand what Xander is going to do relative to Simul Media, relative to um, Sinclair, to be able to optimize that plan. So there needs to be this sort of balance of let the wall garden have their yield, but make data available so an agency can do a, the appropriate job of planning it relative to other media. And is that being done today? I mean, how much sharing is going back to the agencies or back to? The I mean, it's uh, you know one of our so 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 yes, uh, you know it is, um, and I would say that uh, it's it's an important. It's definitely as as these worlds kind of come together, you know, agencies are telling us over and over again that things are getting fragmented and it's very hard to do. Um, to do this sort of meta planning that happens even before you go into a platform and start to build a plan. Um, things like, you know, what they call strategic planning when you're in budget allocation. When you're talking now about a fragment, you know, what used to be a TV budget and a digital budget and an out, out of home budget, you know, now this starts to get splintered, you know, across a number of different devices. <coughs> Um, and it's, it's difficult to, to do this in a consistent way, and that's something that um, we see as a market need, for sure, um, to be able to kind of help, help planners and help the buying community um, be able to build, uh, you know, a strategic plan um, that takes all of this into consideration um, in a way that ultimately means that 
at the end of the day, the buyer, the, the viewer shouldn't be getting that high level of frequency. That's not good for the consumer. That's not good for the advertiser. Um, no advertiser would want to see that. And, you know, we agree. So, um, so I, but the key is it's, 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 it's hard to do this today because of the technology measurement hurdles um, and having uh, all of the devices out there that, that exist today. So figuring out ways to stitch it together on the front end, kind of throughout the campaign life cycle, um, through strategic planning, tactical planning, execution, reporting, measurement, attribution, um, we think is going to help really bring the industry forward. Um, so that you know we're prepared and we we can help our clients be prepared to to deal with these challenges that are only going to get worse. <laughs> you know things will become more fragmented, not less. We don't see, um, you know, one uh, one one mega device um, that's that's going to rule the world. And I just would add, in terms of the walled gardens, I think there's there's something fundamental about the scale that has uh, been created in terms of their ability, the, the amount of data that they have, uh, both behavioral and temporal and all sorts of other things. We did a couple of research projects with Facebook. Um, and their ability to do, um, to put together markets or uh, groups of people on completely different um, uh, criteria that's completely based from an organic perspective in terms of what their behavior is and what their activities are and what their whole profiles are that have nothing to do with demographics. And the effectiveness of that in terms of experience that were done were that much more effective and they were able to provide them with communications that were that much more personalized, customized. So I think there's also now being a backlash, I don't know if you all are seeing it, where um, large advertisers, large marketers are going after their own first party data. Um, I heard McDonald's give a presentation not too long ago saying, okay, fine, we actually have a lot of information about our customers too, and yeah. doing more into loyalty programs and, and trying to kind of come up with competition in that regard to, uh, to kind of have that same kind of data insights. Mm -hmm. So Chris, what impact have you see, has data had, I guess, going backwards and then looking forwards with ATSC coming on, do you see it? Sure, you know, it's been a great discussion on addressability and data. Um, it's, that's a very, uh, you know, national advertising focus and that's certainly an important part of our business. Um, you know, from a, from what, what inherently though, we, we focus mainly on local markets uh, and they're dealing with the same issues but they can get addressability and data for video ads um, from uh, digital providers, digital service providers like Roku, for instance. I think their addressable ads pretty much doubled in 2018, and, um, and, and those are available to local advertisers. They can get uh, pretty good data and addressability from cable uh, through set-top boxes. And uh, broadcast just needs to catch up. And uh, it's really a, a disadvantage right now because we, we only have one offering right now uh, and it, it's not targeted it's uh, limited in terms of data we can give you a rating point and a few demos ATSC so like linear linear or right or well linear and, and, and yeah unless unless of course you know we're putting you on some of our streaming uh, services and uh, ATSC 3.0 as I mentioned before will be a game changer from that perspective and uh, and put us on a, a level playing field with uh, with cable and digital. And are you doing anything? I just read about the a consortium or um, mm -hmm. does that have anything is are you involved? Or like, well, it, it, oh, mm -hmm. it's some open addressable ready with an R. Yeah. <laughs> um, which uh, I think with Vizio as the manufacturer and I think it has to do with the auto content recognition chips and the smart TVs that can collect some data. So to the extent a stream is going over a smart TV, would that do? I'm not a part of that consortium, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, um, so we're part of that consortium. That yeah, so it's, it's the Open Addressable Ready Consortium, and it's very new. And the goal there is to create standards um, that um, uh, sort of that smart TV manufacturers, including you know Inkscape, Vizio, will adopt um, to help normalize um, the ability to deliver an ad um, across these different devices. So it's, 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 we know, we believe it's going to move the industry forward to solve uh, for some of the fragmentation, make it easier for, um, make it easier for both the buy and the sell side. Um, one more question that, that maybe a bunch of people who, who 
um, have some views on is regarding the addressability. And on the one hand, we have heard that that's where it's going and that's something that television needs in order to keep up with digital. Um, but I have also heard um, sort of the counter that really it's, it's the broad reach. Um, and I, I think there was one analyst who noted, you know, the vast majority of advertisers who use TV effectively need to reach everyone. Many of the promises or perceived opportunities of advanced TV presuppose large advertisers actually want targeting in the way it's done on the web. If you want that, you can use the web. Um, so that there still is this branding, this top of the funnel um, function that television or, or premium video can serve. And I'm just wondering what thoughts are on that. Um, do you think that is a reason that addressable has stayed um, relatively small in terms of its rollout, or, or do you see that going up uh, right out of it? Yeah, I mean, I, I love this topic. Um, I think um, I think the notions of how we talk about television and digital are um, as being, from a delivery standpoint, as being different. Are um, you know, as as we as we make progress in in developing this plat a platform that enables more seamless buying across national TV and 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 OTT. Um, you know, we start to see this stuff kind of come together. That said, not we don't we think that maybe a better way to talk about what the future might look like is not um, national TV and digital, but rather upfront and real time bought or impression based and unit based. And so the difference really here is you kind of have to look from the perspective mm -hmm. of an advertiser. Um, there's an analogy that's some people talk about in the industry, this is not an original analogy, um, but it's like when you lay a road down, you know, you need, you need boulders um, and you need sand. And so um, if you're a marketer, you can take that kind of, I'll come back to the road in a moment, but if you're a marketer and you, you are, you know, putting out a new cereal brand, you need to be able to secure all of the major goods that you're going to need in order to, to go to, to launch that. You need your cardboard, you need your wheat, you need your all of those things, and then you're going to need your advertising. And that's something that you're going to plan way in advance. Um, you're going to need to know that you're going to have you're going to have the ability to reach your audience to support that brand being out at the right time when you're launching your product. So those are the those are the boulders, basically. Um, and that's the role that TV has typically played within the media plan, because you're able to kind of reach a lot of people at the same time. So in this world where um, you know consumers consuming their, their TV content across a number of devices, we still need, marketers will still need the ability to secure large amounts of, of ad spend to reach an audience um, in a more upfront guaranteed um, way. They're also gonna need the ability to fill in the sand, right? Um, to, to, reach, to reach the very targeted audience, to follow up, to, you know, to, to have the other types of, to achieve the other media goals that they have. Um, and it will depend on the advertiser, it will depend on the context, but the important thing is that there's flexibility to accommodate for all of these models. Digital, you know, as 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 national TV becomes um, more digitally enabled, it doesn't mean that a lot of the good of television is going to go away. Um, yeah, I think I would, I would I would add. I think one of the the challenges relative to addressable are that, and where that and where in the reach the reach role that TV has uh, has historically played. One of the reasons it played that was that's all it could do. So there's mm -hmm. a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy there. Um, but you know, there, what we are seeing, and we're seeing this now as companies and marketers understand more of their, who their customers are and have more data, and we now have 20 plus years of real digital experience with direct relationships, are they realize that they do need to, and maybe this isn't the best um, analogy, but they need to start, it's, if they don't, may not want to use a rifle to target, but they certainly need to choke the shotgun. I came from Western Pennsylvania, not. <laughs> so, and they realize it can really improve their performance. And, and it's, it is, it's not an accident that we're now seeing packaged goods categories that were historically seen as these massive broad reach ones being attacked by startups that are digital only mm. and that are building from 
subway signs and out of home and podcasts and then they move to satellite radio and they add these things and they're finding that they can use media to effectively build these brands and they're obviously creating awareness with these other things without this sort of quick hit to TV. Now they are coming into TV later in their cycles, tends when they want to really accelerate. But you know, I think that one of the reasons we only talked about the reach awareness part of the funnel was for most of the media you couldn't see down the funnel. Mm -hmm. So it just wasn't a possibility. But I, but I I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say a couple words on on this quote that the vast majority of advertisers use TV. And uh, I think what we heard from the, the last panel uh, that, that we, we've got to remember that there really is three sub-segments of what we are calling TV. One is broadcast, then cable, and digital uh, video. And all of those can be used for reach. They can all be used, um, as was discussed in the last panel, uh, in a broad way. Uh, but they all can't be used for targeting. You know, digital has the best targeting ability, cable next, and broadcast the least. We hope to change that with ATSC 3.0. And, and certainly just in terms of the overall market, targeting is not going to be for everyone. I don't know where the equilibrium will be, but uh, we're seeing targeting take share away from non-targeted or linear, as, as was shown in, uh, in Dave's slide. Uh, but uh, where that equilibrium balances out, hard to say. Um, but, uh, but at the end of the day, um, um, you know, for broadcasters, we're focused on making sure that we can actually play in both uh, marketplaces. One thing I might just say is um, it's a little bit uh, terminology, but you know, we've talked a lot about targeting and addressable, and again, that's sort of a uh, very one-way thinking about it. And another uh, aspect that I think that these digital property and all these addressable sorts of technologies enable is servicing, and so as that potential evolves for how brands and companies actually think about their relationships with their audiences, both current and potential, there's the opportunity to think about um, interactiveness and the ability to communicate, the ability to have two-way discussions that could also transform the value of those, both in terms of attractiveness for people to want to be part of those interactions, as well as for um, you know, prices that can be paid. So as those technologies evolve, I think that could be really interesting to watch. But I, I think a key thing, the, a key mistake the industry makes is we conflate who to target with addressable, where we think addressable only means a very, very narrow target, mm -hmm. right? And um, you know, think about uh, Avengers Endgame. Um, in spite of how big that movie is, there's probably 40% of the population who will never go to see that movie, no matter how many ads they see, no matter how persuasive the ads are. And if addressable could avoid those people, but still get reach and scale for the rest of the country, why not? Why wouldn't uh, Marvel Studio, you know, the, the, why wouldn't they want to avoid the waste that traditional TV um, brings. Um, and if you know you're not going to go, why wouldn't you want them to not <laughs> right, 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 right. Unless I mean, you kind of wanted to be part of the zeitgeist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I will never walk into a fast food restaurant for the rest of my life. So if McDonald's could avoid advertising to me, um, it improves their ROI and it reduces the annoying ads that I get. So, I mean, I, you know, I think again, we just got to think as the one good thing about the stage of the market is there will be more addressable capabilities rolling out for advertisers between between ATSC 3.0 with local, with mm -hmm. national networks being able to do addressable in their inventory. So there'll be, you know, one of the reasons addressable isn't as isn't bigger is there's just a, a limited amount of supply. But as it grows, I think it's a natural thing for advertisers to use and and yeah, you don't want to only target your heavy users because you don't grow brands by doing that. And do you see any distinctions between national advertising or and your local McDonald's advertising in terms of achieving the scale where addressable become, makes more sense? Well, it, addressable has, has a distinct advantage, I think, for local advertisers because often local advertisers want to geo-target around their catchment area if they have a, a place of business. And so um, it's it's uh, we, we're seeing a lot of uh, you know activity there uh, in terms of um, you know having appeal to to local advertisers. 
since they they not generally aren't always trying to blanket the uh, the universe. Is there some point where some weight waste makes some sense? Just that, you know, it might be a cheaper CPM to target a certain geographic region. Uh, absolutely, you know, advertisers all the time are weighing different options on a CPM basis. You know, everything can be broken down to a CPM at the end of the day. Even if an ad, ad is sold on a unit basis, you can still imply what the CPM is. You can see what's more efficient. So you go to a cable interconnect, and it can give you something that zones around your specific location. But if, if you get a cheaper price from a broadcast station, which hits the whole DMA, and, and, and you just do it on the equivalent of your target within that geography, you're just gonna choose the one that, that gives you the, the cheaper price. I also it, think um, there's something to that about quality, too. Um, and if you think about uh, that advertisements aren't necessarily just for one particular individual. So you might see an ad for McDonald's, um, but it's really hysterical, or it's it's share worthy. So you tell other people. So there is an amplification effect, and that's beyond the direct one to one kinds of measurements that we have in terms of virality and sharing and social and other sorts of things that advertisers and those who create ads really think a lot about. Um, and there's a lot of research coming out of Les Bennett and and Peter Fields, who also show just how important that amplification effect is beyond just the media itself. Yep, and I think one thing that it's important for people to understand, particularly with the digitally oriented growth marketers, um, we can talk, we talk about geographies and DMAs and other things because they were based on either, mm -hmm. you know, geographic zones or, you know, you know, you know political designations or, um, or, you know, the reach of a, of a broadcast signal. But in most cases for a lot of these marketers because they're deploying on a performance basis it's just sells mm -hmm. it sells on a spreadsheet yep. and mm -hmm. they'll just move money and if you look at like the large online book, travel booking services they just use geography as another cell like you know when some cells are popping they move it they pull it back and other things like that so there's a lot of marketers that are just very very fluid this way and I think that's one of the things where addressable or some of the, the geographic it, it's a trade-off and they'll see this has more spill this has less spill what's my performance I'm shifting here I'll, I'll, I'll take some spill and as they're getting more longitudinal measurement and understanding not just what sold in 24 hours but what sold in 28 days that will even and we're seeing mm -hmm. that influence things too and Howard, you um, mentioned ROI, and it comes down to ROI, and I'm wondering what you see going for. You know, we have heard some concerns that it's really hard to measure attribution, the measurement, the attribution effectiveness, um, and I'm wondering what you see there, um, what you maybe have seen, you met reference some other countries and what they're doing, and if you see anything effective in terms of measurement standards or <coughs> moving forward. Or yeah, the, the, the reality is because of all of the data innovations that have happened, um, you know, whether it is uh, Nielsen has a service where they directly connect their TV panel with um, Catalina marketing shopper data. So where you can go into that data set and you could directly see someone saw three ads on, um, on MTV for Kellogg's. Did they buy more cereal after the third exposure than they were buying before? Um, you know, bring a, a lot of what Dave's company does, bringing in client first-party data, aligning it with um, with um, ad exposure data, and to be able to do similar analyses. Uh, you know, the industry, the capabilities are wonderful. Um, I think the issue becomes, you know, if, if I'm a media seller, um, there are a lot of other things beyond. TV exposure or video exposure that drives the success of a brand campaign. There's the competitive environment. There's, um, you know, what what different advertisers might do in store. So the question, you know, the question is, does it make sense for a media company to start guaranteeing it? Mm -hmm. Who knows? I think these tools will, you'll see these, these tools used more and more in the marketplace. Well, one thing we've heard um, it, are the problems and challenges with cross-platform measurement. And I'm wondering what you're seeing there. How can an advertiser compare the value of an ad, you know, a purely digital ad, an old school display or certain, you know, versus one on video, versus video shown linearly, a TV program? Maybe, Christina, you have some thoughts. I mean, yes. <laughs> uh, this is the ch this is. I would say, you know, there's there's 
there are a couple of industry challenges when it comes to this fragmentation that we have today and um, measurement of an audience, unduplicated reach, management of frequency across platforms, and um, uh, and you know an overall measurement, right? And so, at the end of the day, though, getting to that bottle, bottle, bottom of the funnel action and understanding the outcome is um, is really, we think, where um, is a common ground, a common denominator. Um, as there are improvements and advances in how we measure, manage frequency uh, across platforms, uh, we think you know grounding in the outcome um, is is a good way for many advertisers to understand effectiveness. The, one other thing in terms of cross-platform, I think a lot of it centers around attribution and trade-offs and which one's more effective than another. But the reality of the customer journey is that all of these touch points work together. So as an individual, you might see an ad, and if you're touched by customer service or you actually buy the product or somebody mentions it to you, there's, there's this whole uh, range of things. And even within the bounds of what can be measured, there doesn't seem to be as much as what I would love to see is more, what are the interrelationships? What are the synergies? Mm -hmm. What are the best ways for various scenarios, various kinds of outcomes, where the packaging of them works particularly well, and where you can show what those cross effects are, in addition to just who's winning. Should it be this platform or that form, platform? How do they work together? But, but what you have, one, one of the things that's important is Cross-platform is a challenge from a syndicated research provider standpoint, Nielsen and Comscore. It's less of a problem for companies who have their own first-party data. So, um, you know, like one great example is um, the retailer Target. They've built a data stack where they have all of their digital ad occurrence data. They have all of their CRM data when people go and use a Target loyalty program. They've um, integrated Visio ACR data and they've integrated that all using a company called LiveRamp, which has a device graph that allows you to link together, um, you know, what you're seeing through ACR, which is which is based on the household router, with what you're seeing on phones and ta and on um, PCs. So, because you have a company like LiveRamp, they've created a cross-platform view for for Target that they're able to use in, in measurement. Great. Well, thank you. I did want to leave a few minutes for questions. So if anybody has any questions. Do we get to ask the audience for questions? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have a question. Yeah. Oh. Over here. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Mr. Ripley, you talked about acquiring content for a digital distribution so that you could compete in that space a little bit. Uh, but uh, what constraints do you face in selling your main product in the digital space from your network affiliation contracts where they try to take control of digital distribution of the product. So the question, just to make sure it's recorded, was what constraints might Sinclair face from its network affiliation contracts in expanding into digital? Uh, it's, it's a great question. You know, we, we have made a concerted effort to get into streaming because uh, that's where the audience is and we need to create more impressions to make available to to advertisers overall. We do have uh, significant limitations uh, from our uh, on our network content. Uh, right as it stands today, we we distribute that over the air and, and through uh, cable and satellite uh, and through virtual MVPDs. But for instance, you won't find it on STIR, and uh, that's a contractual limitation. Uh, we have to distributing that, and and so we have we have fairly narrow lanes that that, that we can uh, we we can stay in as it relates to our network content. So we're focused on creating other content, acquiring new content, and and uh, providing it in in, uh, in places and new platforms where consumers are, and and can create additional uh, impressions for us to sell. Yes, please. Uh, Bonnie Taylor, Tom Daly. Uh, Mr. Ripley, you, you keep bringing up uh, ATSC 3.0 as something that might help broadcasting complete, compete with digital, but like the whole point of this workshop, I thought, was to 
for DOJ to think about how they treat broadcast competition. If 3.0 goes the way you want, won't broadcasting be on an equal footing with digital and then DOJ will need to worry about a competitive difference? So the question is if 3.0 does go the way that um, Mr. Ripley has discussed, would that um, eliminate the differences between the broadcast advertising and linear and uh, digital advertising? Yeah, you got it. Well, so <laughs> me, okay, I think the, the point of this entire workshop is, is, to, is to dissect whether television, which everyone on this panel has been talking about television, and I think it's been abundantly clear they're talking about broadcast, they're talking about cable, and they're talking about digital video. Uh, and they're just calling it television. And, and the point of this workshop is to understand whether those should be viewed in one totality as, as one fungible marketplace. And uh, as I stated before, there are differences in capabilities, but in terms of broadcast versus cable and digital video ads, digital video ads and cable have all the capabilities of broadcast, but unfortunately broadcast does not have all the capabilities of those other two. And ATSC 3.0 will go a long way in, in, in leveling the playing field, but it doesn't stop money from moving back and forth from these markets, and it doesn't stop them from competing. Uh, it, if anything, it makes broadcast a, a less able uh, competitor versus those other sub-segments. Well, and to follow up on that question, if the Justice Department doesn't allow broadcasters who are number three or four in their markets to merge, is it likely that they'll ever build out ATSC 3.0 and be able to compete in the market for targeting advertisers? Well, you know, again, I can't predict the future, but um, you know, it, it, rolling out ATSC 3.0 is a step uh, that will cost money and resources and a commitment to the future. So, um, if it can, local economies of scale cannot support three and four ranked players, then, then I think your, your hypothetical would be correct that, uh, that uh, 3.0 would not be rolled out robustly. And if we care about competition, which is the purpose of the agency, uh, that would be a pro-competitive point of view when what we've heard is that the ad market is moving toward targeting people, not just hitting them in mass, which has been considered to be inefficient or wasteful. Did you want to re say that question? Well, I wasn't adding your answer. question. But okay, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, like, I think the short answer, right, yes, that would be a pro-competitive move. Uh, upgrading broadcast to 3.0 will create more competition for uh, digital video, uh, for digital video ad marketplace and for the, uh, for the cable interconnect marketplace. So I agree with your statement. I also wonder whether they might end up being a premium for broadcast at some point in time that's not addressable. So that um, for those who really want to, I suppose that's uh, that's there in, on a subscription basis. But somehow where it's it's really broad and you're still getting that reach that has the kind of zeitgeist where everybody's watching it like the Super Bowl. You can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting it out there. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, really very much for showing up. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for attending. Um, I think it, um, yeah, that closes it out for this panel. And Daniel going to give some short words. Can I just give one? In terms of, I've just, having been here since yesterday and having had been part of the conversations and having been in an organization that was uh, intended to be rather independent about how to look at this, these kinds of topics across the board. I do think there's a, a, a real appetite among many people with whom I've spoken to continue to support your efforts in learning about this and providing additional information and detail and resources that we have to, to inform what you're up to. So I think we stand ready to continue to help. I can Great, we appreciate it and we welcome. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Thank you. I promise everyone I'll be very brief. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, yesterday, uh, Assistant Attorney General Macon Del Rahim explained that workshops like these enable the antitrust division to stay current with emerging industry trends, new business models, and the latest economics. After listening to the discussion for the last few days, I know we have accomplished that and more. 
Media advertising is a complex and dynamic industry. We applaud the workshop participants for having engaged in such an informed discussion. From industry trends and ad targeting technology to understanding the changing ways in which advertisers think about connecting with consumers, these panels have given us a lot to think about. We will give careful consideration to what we have heard during this workshop and consider the changes in the industry as we continue to update our competitive analysis. We'd like to thank, uh, close by thanking once again Professor Susan Athey for her insightful lecture today and all of our panelists for sharing their perspectives with you. I also want to thank division staff, attorneys, economists, paralegals, and support staff who are all working very hard behind the scenes for a long time to put together this wonderful event. Thank you all for joining us for this discussion on competition in television and digital advertising. This closes the program.